Right. Right. No. You have it wrong straight away. I grew up in Pierce Park. Yes, Ursline Road. Uh, we never actually lived in, in John's Park, but there was a difference. Uh, Pierce Park was actually built before St. John's Park, and then John's Park then just came after that. But we were the Ursline Road, Pierce Park. Yeah, well, I was born in Polbury, and we were two year. I was two years of age when we came from Polbury to the Ursline Road. And my father was working in England at the time, and he didn't even know my mother was at the moving. But it, you're you're a Polbury man as well. But my mother, uh, my mother pulled out of Polbury because our house was getting flooded, right, left, and centre. She'd open up the back door and leave the water out the front door, or vice versa, whatever way the tide was coming. And that's why we moved up to... And then when my father came home then, he actually went to Polbury. And my mother knew what he was coming to, and she said, we're at the moving house. So there was, he never... He didn't settle for years when, when we got up there. So she tells me anyway. Oh, yeah. St Stephen Street and the Mayor's Walk. Oh, my father was Mayor's Walk and my mother was Stephen Street. Uh, Smith. Elizabeth Smith. Tom. Tom that died. Yeah. Tom's mother and my mother, they weren't only two mothers, but they were two sisters. <laughs> they were two sisters. Molly. Oh, Tom was a great character. Tom, uh, it was a tracksuit they used to call him. Tommy tracksuit. So. But the, uh, he was the first cousin of mine. Yeah. Yeah, well, when you when you go past Kilcorn, there was actually no there was actually no houses from there up. You'd have Richardson's farm first, which was a dairy farm for Jersey cows, and then you go out further then, and you had Powers Knock, which was called we named it Mugs Knock. That was all Mugs Knock, and we'd spend all our days out there, all our summer holidays. You'd be hunting rabbits out there, a few little terriers, and uh, you'd be hunting rabbits, and there'd be foxes and badgers around there as well. <laughs> but uh, that's that's where we spent all our holidays, and we'd be out there. There'd be apple trees, crab trees. There'd be sloes, damsons. You'd be just going home, and like it was absolutely fantastic place to grow up. And it was. I had dogs all my life, because my father kept dogs, and my brother kept dogs, so we were reared with them, you know. And we always always kept a few, always a hunting dog, a dog that could catch a rabbit, or a dog that would catch a fox, or whatever, you know. But you did, any rabbits we'd catch, you'd be eating the rabbits. And would you, would you sell them then as well? No, well, we used, to, we used to ferret rabbits when it was illegal, or when it was legal to ferret rabbits and sell them to the greyhound men. You get a five or a pair then, so we'd be off all day, and the rabbits were, they wouldn't be as, they'd be a scarce commodity then, you know, because there were so many fellas hunting them. And if the mixy came, mix of potatoes came, you were shagged all together. But we'd be up at the dog track, and if you were caught doing it now, you'd be arrested. But we'd have the rabbits in bags. They'd be alive for the greyhound men. I hope nobody's going to take offence to that, but that's the way things were, you know. That was the reality of it. And it was a way of making a few bob. And that money then, it, would have to go back to the house. My mother had always, like when we, like I worked for Malai's Butchers and I was on a pound, I think, and my mother would get more than half of that. You know, that's, that's the way things were, you know. I don't know other lads are like that now, but it, more, like even when my brother and sister went to England, they were, one of them went when he was, she went when Nick, he, Betty went, no, it was, Betty went when she was 18. And uh, Betty or Helen then went, or Helen went first, but they'd send back money back from England, you know. That's the way it was all done, you know. Did you go to Scotland Corn? I went to Scotland Corn and then I got more or less expelled out there for missing so many days. So my mother wanted to separate me from the culprit that she taught, which was Mickey Hearn. And myself and Mickey were great buddies, but uh, 
I had Paddy Dower after me at the time. He was the school man that had come around and I was getting threatened with being sent to reformatory school, you know. My mother said, you're going away, you're going away. So she took me out there and she put me into St. Declan's, which was brilliant. That was great, there. that was great down there. But uh, I got a, like, we used to go on the duck down there as well, but not as much. And when you went on the duck, where would you go? We'd end up, if you were on the duck down there, you'd probably go to the park, uh, down around the park and maybe stay up in a tree maybe half the day waiting for the school to be finished you know you'd be looking over at the boys you know but uh no that was it i went to school with paddy paddy the one down there sharon and then when we'd be heading for up around the mental hospital because the mental was all wide open then at the time you know well that, that there was low, there was a farm up at, at the mental hospital at the time a dairy farm as well there and that was a great place to go because you'd be away from everybody and anybody except the patients. But most of the patients were, any of the dangerous ones were, were kept in. But we made great friends with some of the patients up there, you know. And they were nice, some very nice lads. Just hard look stories, fellas, that went in there, you know. So obviously school wasn't the place for you? No, school was never the place for me. You were an outdoor man. Outdoor man and loved it. Every minute of it, Ollie. Every minute of it. I suppose if I... If I'd settled down a bit maybe and, and maybe got more school and God knows where I'd be. I could be anywhere. <laughs> Although I'm happy where I am now. Things worked out okay for me. I met the right girl. <laughs> but I, 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 I that because that area was out the country kind of more or less and most of my girls used to head out the country. Oh yeah. Quite a lot of end up in the country. Oh they love I always wanted to move to the country. And this was a great spot when we got a van. When we got an old van or a car, this is the first, this is the end of the country you'd head to. Because there was always plenty of game around here. Both day and night. If you were coming, hunting in the day, you'd be hunting a few rabbits off the like of the ditches. Or ferreting. But in the night time then you'd be lamping rabbits. You're out lamping them and catching a few rabbits or foxes, whatever it be. Out, you know. Lie down, lie down. Take it easy. But, uh, no, it's a great spot. And, uh, like, you, You'd be heading different parts of the country once you had a, a car, you were ideal, be mulling a bat or whatever. But there was no a lot of fellas hunted from John's Park. There was only there was only me and Leonard, or my brother John, got be good to him, uh, that hunted on our road. None of the rest of the lads had any interest. They were all soccer or hurling. But we were mad for hunting. And then the Flins, they were travellers, moved in up around the corner. Uh, there was about ten children. And we befriended Dan and Jerry because we had a lot in common. None of us wanted to go to school. And also, uh, they had dogs, but they had a couple of lurchers, which I never had. We didn't have the like of Emily or the first ones I got was a whippet and that. But they had a lurcher, Rose. She was a marvellous bitch for picking rabbits and a couple of good terriers for hunting the rabbits off the ditches. So we, Jerry, which is dead and gone, God be good, and he was the young fella as well, and Dan and myself, the four of us, none of, nobody else would hang around with these lads and up around there, because they were travellers. But we'd hang around with the boys and we made great friends and we're still lifetime friends. He's actually living up the road from my mother's house now. And they were born, well, they were all reared above. None of them ever born up there, but up around the corner. So that's, they were... They were all hunting men as well. They were hunting. Their father was a hunting man, as the traveller man was at the time. He was a hunting man. So and actually enough, his sons, took up the same, you know, they'd be at the very same thing. Oh, they show you things that you didn't know? Oh, well, we, we, well we, we learned a good bit off of them and they learned a good bit of, off of us as well, you know, because we had our way of hunting. Now, they were great men with sticks. A rabbit, a rabbit could be sitting down, they're called sitters. Now, the, any rabbit we ever got at the time, Ollie, if we kill a rabbit then, you'd eat him. He wasn't just thrown out. You wouldn't be killing him to leave him there. But I remember Dan with a stick and if a rabbit was sitting down, you would, you'd only wait for him to, to barely move and hit him with the stick. They were mad, throw the stick, come out of the hand, but that, it was like a boomerang, the way that wouldn't come back naturally enough, but that would absolutely flatten the rabbit, but they had a great knack in that. Like the, yeah, they knew how to do it, they were just skilled at it. And then they had another way of like, the way the men throw the, 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 the bowling stone, or the bowler like that, but they had a, an underhand way of in, in throwing it, you know, underhand in this way. Emily, Emily, 
and they throw the stone down underneath like that and they could pick a rabbit out of a seat. They just pop them up. You know, they were highly skilled. At, but they th they were taught that off their father. You know, we never, I, I often knocked out rabbits and in the night time you're going along, you know. You have to be very careful when you're throwing a stick when you have a dog because some idiots would end up hitting the dog instead of the rabbit. So you could go, come out with two dogs and go home with one. That kind of way, you know. But uh, no, that was, that was, we had some, Emily, we had some great times with the lads, you know, and they, they were good men to keep dogs and the father was a skilled man, skilled hunter. I went to the tech when I was 15. Then my dad got sick, father got sick. I enjoyed down there now because I really got on well with carpentry and uh, metalwork. That's the kind of stuff that I wanted to be. Same as my own young fella, even though he, he done well in the leaving, he could have went on maybe to go to college, but he said, I'm not going to college. I want to do something else, he said. I want to do something with my hands. And uh, my father got sick then. He was young when he got sick, 57. And uh, I ended up getting a job down in Morris's timber yard when I was just just barely gone over 15. You had to be 16 to get a job then. But my mother knew the foreman down there, Larry Power, God be good to him. And Larry said, right, we'll start him, say nothing. It was £3.50 was the money at the time. And uh, oh, it was great for the, for the house as well, you know. My mother now would get the £3 more than likely out of that. But that's where I started down in Morris. That's out in the manor now, the old Morris. Do you remember that, Holly? The big, big old place out there, you know. Oh, it was, and they were all, they all seemed to be old men out there. So I was only a, a garçon, a millboy, that's what they were called, millboy. No, no, Graves was with the park. No, this was in the manor. Remember the bit where all the new houses are there now? It's uh, Closegate. That was actually Morris's timber yard. I remember then all the lads would be coming along then to, to they'd be jobbing them. It's like something you see on the television now, reeling in the years. The men would come along then and they'd all line up outside the walls when there'd be a boat in. A boat would come into the docks below, and then the boat would have to be unloaded. Then it'd come back up on lorries, then up as far as Morris's. But the men would be all standing out, standing outside. There might be maybe 40 men or maybe more. And the four men would go down, your job, pass off maybe 10 fellas, your job, your job. And then any fella was jobbed, he was he was in there till the boat was, was, was finished. And then the other four fellas would have to go away, you know. Then they used to bring patients from the mental hospital down as well. And we got very, myself and Kevin Hartley, another man that's dead and gone, I'm on age as myself. And uh, we made very good friends with a lot of the patients down there, you know, because, you know, they were just nice kind of fellas, you know. But, uh, what's that? But they were down working, and they'd be working for less, yeah, there's probably le way less the money than, Emily, Emily, down here, behave yourself. Good girl, good girl, Emily. But uh, that's where I, that was me. No, my first job was working in Malay's after school. My second job then was working in Morris's timber yard. Then I moved on to much better things. Hey, Emily. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, no, they were there. The 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 houses we were. Uh, our houses are 80 something year old now, I think. So, uh, John's Park, that was well built when we moved up, but we were the first houses. Now, Pierce Park was there before I came, like I'm, I'd be 60 now this month. Uh, so that was there 20 years before, and so John's Park was there. But uh, we kind of, we never kind of, John's Park, it was like, for all the world, it was a bit like Bally Bay. When it, when it first came there, there was a lot of ruffians up there now. Grand lads, it all turned out to be very, very nice, lots of nice fellas, you know. But uh, you dare go up as far as Jackie O'Regan's shop, you, where it's still today, O'Regan's shop. Like if you brought up a bike, you were coming back down without the bike. What was that even for you, like? Oh, for us, because we were in Pierce Park. So they saw you Yeah, we saw us, you know, as outsiders, because we were down there. And you could throw stones You could, yeah, exactly. And yeah, but still to this day, you know, they never counted us as as the Johnnies. 
we were Pierce Power Cross Line Road. You can think it a bit posher if you want it, but we had nothing and they had less. <laughs> but it was good, we enjoyed it. And then we, like, you'd, actually enough, you'd, as you get a bit older, you'd be playing hurling with the lads, Joe Cody, you'd bring you up there, you'd be playing hurling with the Johns Park fellas, so you'd befriend a few of them fellas. But we, like, we, you'd never be really accepted into the Johns Park lads. They were the Johnnies, and we were from Pierce Park, Ursline Road. That was it. We used to hang around with our own gang, play a ball on the road, play a hurling on the road. I remember one time we were all playing ball on the road and the cops came along and the old Black Mariah, tube and I got away lovely. I got, I ran like fuck I did. And the next thing uh, here was uh, the cops caught my brother John, which was younger. So I went back to get John. And all the rest of the lads were over the wall and they laughing and black air and I went back. So we got our names taken anyway. I don't think they horsed us away. Took our two names anyway. We had to pay a pound my mother had to pay a pound. The guards barracks was down in South Parade at the time. One of the big old houses in South Parade. And Mick, I'll never forget Mick. He was a hell of a nice cop. I was frightened about it, but to go down apologising. Whatever. Playing ball on the road. A uh, simple thing, you know. The pole, the pole on the road was the goal. And the first fellas to hit the pole, whatever. But uh, we had to pay a pound. And my mother then stopped us from playing ball on the road for as long as she could possibly could, you know. But uh, good old time then. My mother brings us off to Woodstown then, I remember, and she was shoving us in through the window in the bus to get underneath the seat. So as let me just say, we, there were six of us. There'd be probably four of us going out with my mother out to Woodstown. She'd be hiding two of us and paying for two. You'd be hiding, everybody was doing it, you know. You'd have to get the bus then up at, uh, you'd have to walk up the folly, up the folly and up as far as uh, Passage Road, the little cross up at Passage Road there. Up as far as that, oh Jesus, the wall. You didn't mind going up because you were going off to the beach, but the coming back was horrible. Have to get off up there, you know. And would you remember all the, 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 the excitement about Kilcoan and all that? The, the, oh, oh, it was unbelievable. Now, I was never a soccer man, but we'd go up around, the, up around the soccer games then, you know, Finn Harps would be coming down, Shamrock Rovers, there'd be always a bit of trouble there when them lads would be coming down. And they'd be, I remember the older fellas then us would be over the combat wall throwing out anything they could find out of the bison. They'd come up sods of grass and everything, you know, out over the wall at the Dublin fellas coming up. But the Barrick Street Band used to lead, lead them all up every Sunday, or the Sundays that the matches would be here. It was just unbelievable. The amount of people would be going to a soccer match up there every Sunday and then down the road and like maybe into the candy store and into Garvey's and whatever, you know. But uh, oh, were, soccer was a very, very big thing then, you know. And you go to Major Brews, oh, we'd go out as far as Majors. Now, Majors was a place if you got caught, you'd be in trouble. Because he had a groundsman there, uh, the man t looking after the ground and whatever. He was a desperado. He'd have salt pellets in the shotgun and shoot them at you. Now, I never got him shot at me, but I know fellas that did, and got belts of them. We'd be out robbing the apples. And then you get into the. Like, we were all, except my brother were a bit smaller than some of the lads, the bigger fellas we used to go out with, and they'd put you in through the glass panels, into the big glass houses to rob the grapes. To get a grape then was just unbelievable. Like, get the, <laughs> the best bottle of wine you could get now, you know? And we'd have all the grapes and hand them out to the boys, and the boys would fuck off with all the grapes then. So you'd be trying to eat as many inside as you could possibly eat, you know? <laughs> Needless to say, you'd be shitting up the fucking walls out if you hadn't eaten so much stuff, you know. <laughs> but uh, the major, the major was actually a lovely man. The major caught us several times swimming in the big pond up there. Not a big pond that's up there. We used to swim right out onto the bank there. We're only all in skinny dipping. Only all children jumping there, maybe. And then when we got a little bit older, maybe 12 or 13 or whatever. You'd be swimming across there then in Black Arm with the young ones, you know. But the woodland was great around the Sneak in the gates or in over the walls. And uh, what was it? The, the Major was a very nice man. He never kind of, he came down a few times now and never said anything, you know. But the man that was looking at the caretaker fella now, he was a different kettle of fish. And you were right next to, uh, you say, Bally Truckle, where the first glass factory started. Yes. No, no, I remember that. I, got, I had a, I done an interview down there and a test for the cutting shop. And I actually got into the cutting shop. 
and I lasted three weeks. That was my first job. I forgot to know that. No, I was in the Morris's first, then I got an interview down there. That was Johnstown. Johnstown. And I actually passed, do you, really, do you know what they used to cut then? Milk bottles. The, the ends of milk bottles they used to cut. So you'd only have to do the stars up there. So anyway, I got, uh, I got a letter then saying that I passed. So I lasted three weeks there. And I said to my mother, I'm not going back there anymore. Just couldn't handle that. It wasn't meant for me. The factory job just wasn't, could never, I, that was the only factory job that I could have possibly got or would have got, but I, I just couldn't sit in it, you know. So that was, that was that. Emily, Emily, she smelled your sandwich. Uh, yeah, oh, it's yours, is it? Put it better put it in these pockets, because she'll put it in her belly. But, uh, Emily, come down here. Any old characters here on that side? There was an old fella down, there was an old fella down the road now. He, he wasn't really a character, he'd follow you with a stick, all right, you know. But you'd be blackguarding him. But there was two old lads, two farmer lads from up the country, they were up around Mayo. Now, do you remember Waterloo House, Ollie? You don't remember old Waterloo House, but he used to come down, there were two men in the road. They weren't travelers, but they used to travel around, but they came on hard times and sold to Tom, 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 and his son. Do you remember those? Tom, yeah, it could be now, but we used to bring him down. My father used to bring home meat for the dogs, right? cows or pigs livers and stuff like that. Now we'd bring down the stuff down to the boys. They were very nice men. Very ni and they were living and if you you don't remember Waterloo House, do you? The old house was there. But there was just one little part of it only left there. Sit down, sit down. Only one little part of it left there. And they used to set up shop in there, sleep in there. And uh, just as you go down Polbury, if you turn down for Polbury, uh to where the new houses are there that they're not that new now, but they're new to me. Like, with a, a railing around them. As you turn down for Polbury, they're on the right-hand side as you're going down. That was called Waterloo. There was an old Waterloo house there. An old, an old ruins. And the boys used to stay there. And myself and John befriended them fellas. We befriended fucking more hobos and whatever, I don't know. But they liked us and we liked them. They were harmless men, absolutely harmless. And we bring them down and they cook up the liver down there. And they'd say, do you want a bit? So yes, we'd be mad for a bit of this. My father now would say, don't be eating that stuff, that's pig's liver. You know, I don't know what was up with pig's liver, because we used to eat cow's liver, sheep's liver. So the boys would have it done. I didn't know what kind of an old flavour, but it was off the old, it was like a barbecue. Oh, we'd be chopping away on this stuff down there anyway. And the next time then he'd bring us home a bit of stuff, we'd bring it down to the boys again, you know. But I don't know what ever happened to them. But there, that was, they were two really nice old characters. And then there was another man used to come up the road and another... Uh, the lads used to be black them two balls of sunshine, they used to call him. A man used to come up and, uh, well, it was only later on that, like, when we got a bit older, we found out that the man was in the war and we heard that it was shell shock or something like that, you know. But uh, we kind of got a bit friendly with that fella as well and he was looking for a... There was another fella, another fella that came up, Big Brownie. Yeah, you... Uh, how old are you, Ali? You're 40... Oh, 56, you're not too far behind me then. But there was a big brownie, oh, he was a fucking big, oh, he was a big man, tall man, big lump of a fella. I'd say now if he was eating right and tall, he'd be right, Jock, you know. But uh, this fella, big brownie, and everybody else on the road was frightened of life of him. But Jesus, by did we get friendly with this fella. So he wanted to buy a bike. So we went off looking for bits of bikes up around the backs. And fair play to me father, he put a bike together. I don't know how much you got, maybe it was a five or a maybe, I'm not, not sure exactly, it's a long, long time ago. But Jesus, by your mum was delighted with this bike, it was bad for the bike. We'd get a wheel off of this old bike up the backs or whatever, you know. And uh, Big Brownie. I don't know what ever happened to that poor old man either, you know, he's just another... Like, even to this day, you're, you're very good to homeless people. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know my mother, my, the, it must come from my mother. Now, my father, but, uh, he was kind of a quiet man. But my mother was always a great woman with people. And there used to be a tinker man come along there outside our house and he'd sharpen the... My mother was a dressmaker. They call them scene dresses now or whatever. But my mother, she made dresses for the best of people and whatever, and wedding dresses and whatever. But this man had come up and he'd sharpen 
the scissors for me mother. Now it'd be only a cup of tea and a sandwich and he'd sit outside the door. I remember that just like yesterday. He'd sit outside and the summer seemed to be nicer and the summer seemed to be a lot, you know, warmer and people were more friendlier than what they are now, you know. But he'd come up there and that's where I, I think I got that out. My mother had a great old nature. There was like, like a, a, if somebody needed a fag, because I remember my mother would say to me, go up to Mrs. Heron, got got her, she's dead and gone now. Go up and see a Peggy a fag that she can be loaned until the morning. That was the way it was. Go up and get the fag then and repay it back. Or a pinch of sugar, you know, or a, a tea, you know, that, that type of thing, you know. And uh, I think that's more or less where it came out of him. My mother was always like making clothes for, she'd make clothes for us, go to the jumble sales and get clothes and bring them home and tailor them up that you'd have a pants. I remember one story now, I'll tell you, I, I, it often kind of comes to my mind. My mother got this tweed green coat. This was some coat now. But the fucking coat was for a girl. So anyway, she said, Jim, it was the winter time. This coat, this coat will be lovely on you now, Jim. I'll do some job on that. So what she do, she changed around the buttons. You know the way the buttons for the boy was on one side and vice versa. So she took it up, done something with the collar in any but my mother had a way of convincing you that this it was this was like that magic coach a man wears anyway. So anyway, uh, I goes up to school the next morning. I thought I was the bee's knees, going up uh, into St. Declan's, up along the avenue, walks up all the boys anyway. It was like I waited for them all to get together, but I didn't, I was just late. And here all the boys were at the gathering anyway. Well, the next minute, boy, it must have been like fucking Bozo the Clown. All these lads started laughing at the one time. <laughs> and I looked around and thought they were laughing at somebody else. It was me, though. <laughs> so anyway, I went home and I said to me mother, I'm not wearing that coat anymore. I'm never wearing that again anyway. So she said, you have no other coat wearing. But when I get down as far as the school or near the park, I catch it, I roll it up and shove it underneath the bushes. So I was the only one I was going up, up to the school. If I told them things to my kids now, and I, and I think of what they have, the, the girls have just in the attic, there's clothes that they have. But there were hard times, but good times. You know, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be throwing back the dinners now, you know. We'd have one big dinner there of a Saturday. Now my father would bring home skirts and kidneys. You'd have handles and line bones. No, no, he worked in clover meats. He worked in the freezer over there, but they uh, he had an old qui uh, Quigley motorbike, and he'd bring home this big box of meat, and we'd have the, the stew then of a Saturday, be up on the table, just a big thing of meat, and geez, you couldn't wait to get at this. Now, the girls weren't great for, for the like of that now, and the spuds, and uh, we'd have every vegetable under the sun, because there was loads of veggies and loads of spuds, the meat wouldn't be like, as, like we'd have, but we could have uh, uh, the like of, uh, what do you call it, poor steaks of a Sunday. Now everybody wouldn't be having poor steaks, but my father would get them a bit cheaper. Like poor steaks even today now is a, an expensive meat. But we'd have these up, my mother would have to do two or three of them and stuff them and putting them together. Oh, geez, but it was absolutely lovely, you know. But there were good times, but there were hard times, you know. There weren't a lot of money around. Oh, a lot of a lot of people worked in John's Park. A lot of people from John's Park worked in Clover Meats. Now my father worked in the foundry too, but uh, there was a strike on over there, and he wouldn't pass the picket. So, which a lot of fellas did pass the picket, and it was as bitter in the foundry. In the foundry. Okay, so it was a bad strike in Clover. Oh, a bad strike in Clover. So my, my what? Oh, way back, my father headed off to England then. When that there seemed to be no result in this one in. There, so he headed off over to England. He got a job then over there. Stayed there for years. Then my mother sold furniture. I remember her telling it just like yesterday. She sold some of the furniture out of Polbury in order to get him the ticket to get home out of Polbury. That'll tell you, but they were, they were very loyal and women were very loyal to their men then, you know. Well, some of them anyway. <laughs> my one, my mother was anyway. But, uh, you know, and then the lads were in England, Michael and, Helen were in England, they'd always send home books as well, you know. That was always being waited for. And there was only one, there was only a phone then. My sister then went off to Canada, she's over there. 
She must be there 50 years now, Henry. 40, 45 or 50 years. Hey, sorry, Emily. But uh, there was only one phone on our street at the time. One phone. Mrs. Heron had it up the road. You'd have to book a call at that time, Ollie. You'd have to book a call, Helen would have to book a call, and then all the Herons, there was 10 of them in the family, and they'd all have to go into one room, and my mother would be in the hall, waiting for Helen to ring, and then the chat, I don't know how long, it might go on maybe 10 minutes, a half an hour or something, and we get to say hello to Helen, you know? But uh, they were so important, really, one phone on the street. You know, that'll tell you. Oh, Jesus was absolutely mad, without a doubt, you know? But, okay.